is Joy News Prime. Good evening and coming up on Joy News Prime today, Parliament lays public election instruments to affirm December 7 as a date for this year's election after a proposal to move the date forward to November failed to pass yesterday. After two years without any allowances from government, nurse and midwife trainees reject an offer from government to pay them 150 Ghana CDs a month and threaten to hit the streets. Governing National Democratic Congress takes over from the New Patriotic Party as the political party making the worst indecent statements on radio. The party has, however, dismissed the survey report. In business, the finance minister prepares to deliver a supplementary and mid-year budget review in parliament on Monday. Analysts do not expect much improvement in government revenue mobilization. And uh, heavy rain submerged communities and farms in the Bulsa North District of the Upper East Region. Also coming up in this bulletin is Sports Entertainment and Joy News Interactive. Joy News Prime, Ghana's most comprehensive two hours of television news, is also available across Europe on ABN Television. My name is Araba Kumsin. Stay tuned. Now, a public election instrument 2016 to affirm December 7 as the date for the conduct of this year's election has been laid on Monday, barely 24 hours after Parliament voted to reject the date change. The Constitution Amendment Bill 2016 could not pass because the majority side could not marshal enough votes to convince their colleagues on the minority side to support it. The public election instrument is needed to affirm December 7 as the date for the 2016 polls. Ahead of that, however, the minority in Parliament stood controversy in the House with a claim that some NDC MPs may have actually supported the rejection of the election date bill. Uh, they explained that this was because the 95 votes against the bill uh, exceeded the number of minority MPs in the chamber at the time. Uh, the claim was, however, rejected by the Speaker. If you have to listen, I'm saying that yes, indeed, the total number that voted is right. Honourable members, I'm saying that the total number members, is right. Honourable members, you know, I've just indicated to you. A few seconds. Some, some of the people have who have remarked members, who have remarked as having been present. Honourable members, present. members honor and I'm telling you, on authority, that those of us who have been present, I will not, I will not further litigate it. No. The point has been made. <laughs> Uh, you are completely out of order. You are out of order. Meanwhile, the Speaker of Parliament says Thursday's rejection of the proposed amendment to the Constitution is not necessarily a victory for any one side. Members, there's no nothing to correct about the figures because I pronounce it. Nobody raised an issue, and it is now that is what has been captured. That is what has been captured. That is what has been captured in the votes and proceedings. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, it looks like you are getting you are getting the trend wrong. I'm not questioning the figures. I'm not questioning no, the figures. But you made a very significant point that yes. your total number was 90. Yes. Yes. So, so if you have patience, so, listen. If you have patience, listen. <laughs> you are out of order because we got the highest 125, the most 95. And that is the correct figure. As to those who are jubilating after the declaration of the result, that is their own problem. <laughs>
because the results were not one of majority and minority. But as to one particular group of people who have decided to jubilate after the declaration of the results, I started singing, that is their problem. All my best, page 11. Our former chief of staff, Nana Tudazi, has waded into this uh, matter. He says parliament uh, missed a brilliant opportunity to reform the acrimonious transactions from government to the transactions from one government to the other. And uh, he was saying that the shooting down of the bill this year was a, a, a mistake by the MPs. Um, he says advocate, he spent years advocating a longer period for the handing over from power from one regime to the other. And he insists the legislature completely fail the nation by unduly uh, not passing the, the, the bill that came before parliament. The word I would say is lack of consensus. You understand? I mean, this political uh, debate that was going on between Obi and um, uh, Yao, you know, uh, clearly uh, shows the lack of consensus in this country. It's a very deep-seated uh, matter, and that's what I'm talking about, uh, uh, polarization, you see. There's nothing that runs in this country without maybe either NDC or MPP or that, and, and it's affecting us, social, political, economic, everything, our life. Now, coming back to your question, you understand, it's not everything that's written in the Constitution. A lot of it has to do with consensus, uh, consensus building, it has to do with out of parliament, out of executive, sitting back, the, out of your party, you know, uh, seniors and elders in the party coming together, say, look, we need to do this. How do we do it? If we need money, executive, how can you do this? A lot of consultation. And that is what is missing. You see, there's too much partisanship in the country, and it's affecting everything. If we also see that 7th November is desirable and will enhance and you know have an impact on the transition, and if we think that transition, you know, or poor transition has affected us and brought us this far, you know, so we are together you're going to conclave and they said we must do it you must have we must have the willpower now the willpower was developed until the last minute of the vote the partisanship setting saying that the ec cannot escape blame but you see when you talk about ipac what is the ipac doing ipac is in advisory position ipac could influence they, could, they should be seeing that the time is running out so ec Come on, go ahead. EC is in IPAC. You understand? It is important that we don't see it. It's a the problem. If you look at the ECOWAS protocol on democracy, good governance, it talks about the need for all parties, all interested persons, to support the electoral commission. Not Mrs. Osei. Or Mr. Osei. You know, I think that's the, there's too much you know, focus on the individuals. We must look at the institutions. We must build our institutions. You understand? Mm -hmm. Nobody is The democracy we are practicing here was built by Ghanaians mm -hmm. in 1992. We've come so far. We've had how many? Five, six elections. We have international reputation. Why can't we sustain it? If there are challenges, why don't you prune it? You understand? It's like a tree. We, 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 we have problems. We must nurture it. We must pour water in it. We must prune it. We must cut off the, uh, the, the, the dead growth and all that. But at the end of the day, it is a collective action. That's what I'm saying. And that collective action is based on consensus. You see, it, should, it shouldn't necessarily all end up in a vote. A secret vote, any result can come. And I'm not surprised that it happened this way. The, the, before that vote, we should have almost like pledged to each other that we will honor our word. Each one of us. And NDC will make sure all their members are in parliament. MPP will make sure that all their members are in parliament. Because this will create a, a great historical you know, step. That what this has done, in fact, is that we have pushed or postponed or extended the 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 um, um, uh, polarization of this country for another four years and that's uh, nana atadazi he's a former chief of staff and uh, he was criticizing parliament for failing to pass yesterday's constitutional uh, amendment bill uh, in the house yesterday now he was speaking to joy fm uh, host of the super morning show on joy fm kojo yang 
Yangson. Let's stay in Parliament because the government has over the years not resolved conflicts well. That's according to the former executive director of the West African Network for Peace Building, Emmanuel Bombande. Though not exactly part of his mandate as deputy minister designate for foreign affairs, Mr. Bombande, who faced Parliament's appointments committee on Friday, is hoping to bring his expertise to bear to help the Mahama administration resolve the many local conflicts. He also told Parliament during his vetting, though not a card-bearing member of the governing NDC, he subscribes to its uh, social democratic credentials. Derek Ekosam was at the vetting and has come through with this report. President Mahama earlier this month appointed the conflict resolution expert for the position of Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration. But before being confirmed, Emmanuel Bombandi had to face Parliament's appointment committee to decide his fate. The vetting, which lasted for more than three hours, saw the nominee answering questions on his conflict resolution expertise rather than his diplomatic credentials. On the brink of uh, non-governmental, non-governmental, and it was on social... Uh, Democratic values. The social democratic values. Yes. Are you a card bearing member of NDC? Yes. At the Congress. But it's also true that my political worldview, my convictions, my ideology are social democratic values. But languages. When you speak of English, French, you, def you describe that as working languages. But when you talk about the local languages, you you differentiate. I mean, I know you've been working on peace building in Ghana, B-Mobile, and all of that. Uh, is it that you don't consider the local languages working languages? You, you, you seem to be making these distinctions, and I see that a lot recurring in other pages. Uh, can you uh, help us understand why you do that? You don't consider our local languages working languages? Honorable Chair, our working languages can be, our local languages can be working languages, but within the confines of what we would call the international arena. But not only that, even in our country, in a lot of the facilitation work, we end up speaking uh, English. Mr. Bombande opined that government's posture in the resolution of chieftaincy disputes and conflict resolution is the reason they recur adding that the issue was not being tackled from its roots. Well, all these conflicts have a narrative. And the reason they are protracted is because the competition of the narrative is that each of us, it doesn't matter if our ethnic group is a big one or a small one, has a strong conviction about their belongingness and what they want, including chieftaincy. Now, you, you don't litigate that, though most of the approaches in the past has been to try to litigate it. But you engage in the transformative capacities based on established law. He made it clear that he was opposed to plans by the Inspector General of Police to ban social media during this year's elections, arguing that banning it for just that period would not wash away the evils the ban seeks to prevent. Mr. Bombande also debunked allegations that his appointment showed one it was partisan. Rather, he says it should be every Ghanaian's dream to serve the country at any given time. For Joy News, Derek Ekosam. Let's stay a while longer in Parliament because Finance Minister Seth Tepe will on Monday present supplementary estimates to Parliament, popularly referred to as the Supplementary Budget. The presentation will afford the Minister an opportunity to highlight the state of the economy and request approval of Parliament to spend more money this year. Majority Leader Alban Bakbin, who disclosed this, said the House will next week focus more on critical business of government before Parliament goes on recess on the 29th of this month. We decided that the business is so huge and we may not be able to carry through all what we have started. And so the proposal of the House is for us to focus on critical bills that we can complete before we go on the adjournment on the 29th. And then the House is likely, the House is likely to be recalled either getting to the end of September or early October to come and continue with business since elections have now been decided to be on December 7th. And so, Mrs. Mrs. Speaker, we then decided to zone on a number of bills. And basically when you go through it, those bills are time-bound 
and some of those are part of our relationship or understanding with the IMF. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, members who have seen that some of the bills that we've started are no longer being mentioned in the report. The intention is for us to take those on in uh, uh, October when we come. The focus will be on bills. So we'll be looking at the right to information bill, Ghana AIDS Commission bill, National Disaster Management Organization bill, Technical Universities bill, and then a few of the financial bills like Customs Amendment bill, Income Tax Amendment bill, Supplementary Appropriation bill, and there are some critical ones that will come. In fact, one has been laid, but we've already received the report from the committee, which is the company's amendment bill. Now, responding to the business statement, MP for Ekumen Ponya, Isaac Isiama, said government would have to come clear on the current challenges with electricity supply. Last month, this house approved a loan agreement for the purchase of prepaid meters and the accessories. My worry is that, as we speak now, the commercial agreement has not yet been brought to this house. And we are rising, we don't know what's going to happen, whether they will go ahead and procure those meters. Because so the essence of getting the commercial agreement is to look at the specification as a committee on mass and energy. And so that those meters obviously meet our standards. These are the things we may, we may be looking at. But if, as you speak, the loan has been approved by this house, we don't have the commercial agreement as you speak. And that, that's something that's uh, missing here. An amount of $80 million has been approved by this house. $80 million dollars, or dollars yes, has been approved by this house. Uh, the committee of mass energy doesn't have the commercial agreement to handle it. And that is my worry. This same question, I've had an urgent question about the frequent interruptions in the power supply. Let's speak we Ghanaians need to be told what is happening. Doom so is real. We need to be told. Let us admit it and program this because gadgets are being damaged. People are losing their people. If you know the answer, if you know the answer, why do you ask the question? If you know the answer, why do you ask the question? So, no, so you made the point that you found the agent question. The majority leader was the procedure. You're watching Joy News Prime here on the Joy News channel on Multi TV. We're taking a short break. We'll be right back. You're welcome back. Our going vice chancellor of the University of Ghana, Professor Ernest Aite, has made a strong call for the reforms at the Ghana Education Service. At a lecture in Accra Thursday evening, he said the education service has become an old fashioned system that is holding back innovations in public schools across the country. He added that the only way to encourage better performance is to go back to the drawing board and refashion the Ghana Education Service. Professor Ines Aite was speaking at the 25th anniversary lecture organized by NDK Financial Services on the theme, Politics of Educational Reform in Ghana. According to him, the dynamics of education have changed. Therefore, they need to change the current structure of the Ghana Education Service. We have to reform the Ghana Education Service. The time it was created was a long past. The ideals for the school system have changed. The world has changed. There's really no reason why school boards cannot take basic decisions on the pupils or the students. No reason. And yet, we have a rather uh, old-fashioned system that holds back innovativeness in schools. It's time we as Ghanaians debated the structure and the functions of the Ghana Education Service. He also described government's current policy of converting polytechnics into technical universities as a non-starter. Today, we are turning our polytechnics into technical universities. You change something because there's a problem. And the, what you are proposing to put in its place, you can show that it is better. Or you can show that it's the best way to solve that particular problem. 
how did this reform thing come about? It came about because polytechnics are complaining for several reasons. Are they getting complaints? Yes, they are getting complaints. They are complaining about lack of many things. So you've got to solve that problem. Do you solve the problem by simply redesignating them? I don't believe that's how you do things. You solve the problem by going to the basic grassroots and dealing with the issues. But General Secretary of POTAG, David Wowee Brown, has slammed the Vice Chancellor over the comments that conversion of polytechnics into universities was an exercise in futility. Speaking on Newsdex Friday morning, David Wowee Brown said government identified the challenges of polytechnics before rolling out the conversion policy. I do not want to believe that uh, Professor Ayte and the Vice Chancellors are seeing the conversion of the polytechnics into technical university as what going to compete for their students. They usually will take the best students and then those students who were not able either to go to the university may come to the polytechnic. Some of them maybe read courses that ideally they may not want to. We are going to have two platforms, giving a platform to very good students who would prefer a technical education to come to the technical universities and two, technical students who are not having the platform to go to technical, uh, the traditional university to go and do or further their technical uh, uh, education. So these are the two things we are, or two best we are killing with one stone. The Ghana Nurses and Midwives Trainees Association is threatening to hit the streets soon over what it says has been the non-payment of the allowances for the past two years. The threat to demonstrate comes at a time government has announced it will be paying them an allowance of 150 Ghana cities. The association's financial secretary, Omaru Musa Mohammed, says government's refusal to pay the allowances is making their work very difficult. The reason is that government is saying that there's no money to pay and he wants to admit more people into nursing and midwifery okay, so that uh, you have more people when you finish you look for your own job but which is not the right thing you are admitting more people when they come out they can't get job to do they have to look for their job okay so what we are saying is we want the allowances back and the 150 Ghana when you look at the press release, okay, although we haven't gotten document to that, but on the social media, I saw that they said they'll be paying it till we get access to the student loan. Meanwhile, we are not saying student loan. You are saying non-tertiary education. Okay, it's in there. Yes, he has to change it the way it will do. If not, if not, they are pending demonstration. And I'm telling you, they are pending demonstration. We have phases. We have phase one, phase two. Okay, we use our diplomatic means. To, to channel our grievances. So that's what we want to do. The Otehene Osajifo Amwetia Oferipeng II has called on Ghanaians to speak up and hold their leaders accountable when they notice incidents which are clearly detrimental to the environment and their livelihoods. Speaking at the Ghana Health and Safety Institute Professional Summit on Friday, the Ochehene also pointed out that institutions like the EPA cannot operate effectively if they are not independent bodies. Jennifer Ikwama has more. An internationally known environmentalist, the Ochehene Osajifo Amwitia Ofuripeni II was emphatic in his belief that poor leadership was the root cause of environmental degradation and its resultant impact on the livelihoods of the citizenry. He admonished citizens to speak up when confronted with acts that are harmful to the environment and the society at large. Every time you wake up in this country, there's some filling station being mounted somewhere in our city. Sometimes you see it and it defies logic and reason in residence where people live. And when people lodge their complaint, we are always told orders from above. What we're doing in this city with filling station, we are preparing our people one day, and I don't mean to be a curse, something is going to happen. No, listen. But I'm here this afternoon to tell you, professionals, men, women who are gathered here, knowledgeable in your own ways, that we cannot be silent to the cry of poor folks. That this was not set up our forebears. 
only to benefit the privileged few. So we have to speak. Speak when you see an injustice. Speak when you confront wrongdoing. Speak when you have to condemn corruption. He also advised that, in order to make the EPA more effective, it was important for them to be detached from government. EPA cannot be under the Ministry of Environment. The Mineral Commission cannot be under the Ministry of Lands and Forestry. There has to be an independent, autonomous body as a regulator. The ones who may have the courage to tell government that this policy is not going to go. This is wrong. So all these regulators, if they did what they're supposed to do, it won't happen the way it is happening. That's also regulators have to be independent from the policy maker. If the policy makes one and the same as a regulator, it doesn't work. Who's checking who? Meanwhile, an occupational hazard specialist is calling for a national law to consolidate health and safety regulations in the country. Joe Steve Annan believes that the lack of a single law is making it difficult to effectively monitor the health and safety policies of public and private companies. Health and safety regulations that we have in Ghana are a lot, but in pieces. And not, I mean, all of them are not under any specific organization. They are fragmented. You know, the Ministry of Manpower and Labor has the Labor Act, a small section there. We have the Factory Offices and Shops Act being run somewhere. The Inspectorate of Minerals Commission has the LI-2182, which has a section applicable for the mining section. We have the Radiation Protection Bill under Ghana Atomic Energy Commission, and we have the pesticides and stuff under EPA. So imagine, and I've not finished, it's a lot. So who is running health and safety? Everybody is running, so there's no control. So the nation has to get a health and safety policy and a particular institution responsible for managing health and safety in Ghana. That institution will have to plan implement, check, audit, monitor, and review health and safety systems in Ghana. As I speak, we don't have health and safety, national health and safety policy. For Joy News, Jennifer Kwamua. And we're taking a short break. We'll be back with business, but still ahead in the bulletin, scores of residents have been displaced following widespread floods that ripped through the Upper East region following torrential rains there over the past 48 hours. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Thanks for staying with us. It's time for business. And Emmanuel uh, uh, Abwaje Uyafi joins us right now. Emmanuel, what's the top stories uh, well, uh, in business? Okay, the top story is that uh, the Minister of Finance is expected to present uh, the mid year review estimates of the budget mm -hmm. for this year, as well as present a supplementary budget to Parliament on next Monday. And we, prior to that time, we've been discussing or we've been talking to some economists and some analysts who are expressing the view that this year's review is not going to be anything, you know, different because revenue mobilization is still a problem here for the nation. All right, mm. take it away. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining me on business. Finance Minister Seth Tepe is expected to present to Parliament a supplementary and a mid-year review budget next Monday. George Rafi has been finding out more about some of the areas that the budget may touch on and why the presentation at this time. The presentation has come about as a result of some challenges in meeting most of the macroeconomic targets set out in the 2016 budget. Government was, for instance, looking at an economic growth of 5.4% and a year inflation target of about 10.1% and a fiscal deficit target of 5.3%. We was also looking at a revenue target of 38 billion Ghana cities while his expenditure he was looking at about 43 billion Ghana cities. The benchmark price of oil revenue, which was also pegged at $53 a barrel, will be reviewed. However, Joy Business is learning that most of these targets will be revised, especially when it comes to the economic growth, which may be reviewed down to about 3.9%. 
as well as the deficit. The finance minister also announced revenue and expenditure numbers for the first half of 2016 and expected fiscal numbers for the rest of the year. He will also be seeking parliamentary approval to spend additional funds that have come in what some will call the supplementary budget. Joy Business is learning that the finance minister wants approval to spend some monies that have come in from the energy sector levy, which is expected to be advanced towards addressing the legacy debts in the energy sector, which was threatening the existence of some commercial banks. But this presentation helped convince investors that government is on track in stabilizing the economy as well as dealing with the overruns. Dr. Joe Abe is an economist. I think it will take more than words. It will take a backup in terms of more explanation. Because it, you can go and say all manner of nice things today. But where, unfortunately, the government of the day must understand is that there is a question about why should I believe what you tell me. I'm sorry, but with so many years in public life, I get news items and I cannot understand what is happening. Many also will be looking forward to see whether government may come up with some additional measures to check its rising expenditure, especially in an election year. You're still watching Joy News Prime. In our headlines, Parliament lays public election instrument to affirm December 7 as the date for this year's election after a proposal uh, to move the date forward to November failed to pass yesterday. There was some confusion uh, in Parliament uh, after the minority leader suggested some majority MPs voted against the amendment governing uh, the bill. Now, the governing National Democratic Congress takes over from the New Patriotic Party as the political party making the worst indecent statements on radio. The party has, however, dismissed the survey report as a fine. Now, the governing National Democratic Congress says it must not be blamed for intemperate language used by its activists or supporters. This comes as the latest language monitoring report by the Media Foundation for West Africa for the month of June cites the party's activists as having the highest number of indecent expressions. During the month, a total of 129 incidents of indecent expressions were recorded on a total of 2,000, over 2,000 radio programs monitored on 50 radio stations across the country. The report said officials, supporters and members of the NDC were cited as having used 49 of the indecent expressions followed by officials, supporters, affiliates of the uh, opposition New Patriotic Party who have been uh, the number one culprits in previous reports. Here's a news desk report. The programs monitored included news bulletins and political and current affairs discussion programs aired on the 50 radio stations. There was male dominance on all the programs monitored from the presenters and host to the panelists, interviewees and callers. The Media Foundation said there was however no gender-specific indecent expression. The 129 indecent expressions recorded during the period worked up to an average of 32 indecent expressions a week. In terms of categorization, the 129 indecent expressions recorded fell under six categories of expressions. Unsubstantiated allegations, insulting and offensive comments, provocative remarks, comments endorsing violence, tribal slur, and comments promoting divisiveness. Majority of the indecent expressions recorded were insulting and offensive in nature. The NDC has however rejected the findings suggesting it is erroneous for the Media Foundation for West Africa to link the party to comments passed by individuals. 
That notwithstanding, Deputy General Secretary George Lawson says the party will conduct its own investigations to ascertain the truth or otherwise of the findings. How can the NGC use abusive language? The NGC is not, it's an entity. It's not a human being. Mm. So if individuals have gone already, that is not NGC. If the party issues a statement, you attribute it to the party. You are not saying a thing. That is an uh, entire... So, so you, think, you think this document is flawed? This analysis made by Medimia Foundation for West Africa is flawed in the first place? If an individual goes to make a statement, attribute it to him that party, but you don't say the party. You cannot say uh, a member of my party goes to do something and say NDC did it. No, that one is wrong. Unless NDC comes out with a statement and insulting statement. That the is party. to say the NDC is not aware that some of its members are using I abusive language aware. on radio. I am, we are not, I am not aware. It's not that we listen to all radio stations. You can't listen to all radio stations. So we we'll have to find out. Man, yeah, what did you say? We need to find out. Yes, if you find it, you said it then quickly. And I'm asking whether the NDC will take a look at this report and we, we, use we, we, it. We have not been once we get a copy. We have not been. We, you've just drawn my attention to it. So okay. if we get it, yes, whatever we do, we have a mechanism, an internal mechanism in dealing with those okay. issues. So right. we'll do accordingly. So from the past. We're staying a while longer on this issue because the executive director for Media Foundation for West Africa, Suleiman Abraima, however, maintains their report is credible and targeted at political parties. He's urging the parties to take their time to thoroughly read the report before making conclusions. Suleiman Abraima spoke earlier on the polls. I think that it is not compulsory when party officials or politicians are called to speak on issues. It, isn't, it doesn't take anything away if they say, well, this is a subject that I am not conversant with or haven't read it, rather than to rush to the media and say or react to something that you haven't read. That is number one. Number two is that this is not the first report we are issuing. This is the fourth in the series of reports we've issued um, for the language monitoring project. In all the three earlier editions, the MPP affiliates, supporters, and officials of the MPP were said to be uh, in the lead or were, were cited as the, those dominating in terms of persons or yes, persons who are using uh, abusive or indecent expression. Of course, at the time, I have heard um, in, on all those three occasions, I've heard um, officials of the MP, NDC. Um, commending the project and saying that this is a credible institution, they have experience in what they are doing, and therefore it is something that really reflects the reality. At that time, I don't think that any of them said that, well, because it is MPP supporters, officials and affiliates that have been cited, it is not right to say that it relates to the MPP. Now, the other point is that if you read the report, what we have said is that officials, affiliates, and supporters of the NDC are you know, dominating in terms of the number of people who were cited and the parties that they belong. We did not say in our report that NDC as an entity um, has you know, dominated in the use of abusive language. And that is why I think it is important that Party officials, when they want to react to issues, it's important, first of all, for them to read. The last point I want to make is that perhaps it's so instructive that you have a deputy general secretary of a party saying that, look, if our members, officials, or supporters go out there and say something uh, that is considered abusive or that is considered inappropriate, hold the individuals accountable, even though they may have been doing so in defense of the party. And he, he cites the issue of the Supreme Court and saying that is why the Supreme Court is holding the individual. But we also know when the matter was called before the Supreme Court, we know the people who are defending the individual. And we know that if not all of them, majority of them are NDC officials, NDC gurus, or NDC supporters. And that, for me, suggests that, well, these people were doing what they were doing uh, because they were acting in a way that we thought was promoting the party. Therefore, if they have found themselves in trouble as a result of doing that, we have an obligation to defend them. 
time for sports now and uh, Asari Bediako joins us with some bad news. The Black South Lights have been kicked out and they're not going to the African Youth Championship. Azari, why? What it's happened? A it's a big shame. We lost 3-1 in the first leg. Mm -hmm. We needed to score two and answer goals, but we ended up scoring only one. That means that we will not be playing at the 2017 African Youth Championship in Zambia. And, the lot, and we've been there consistently after winning the competition in 2009. And the Black Queens were beaten by Germany. Oh my by goodness, 11, 11 goals. goals to nothing. What a shame. <laughs> anyway, give us the details. Okay, so let's talk sports here on Joy News Prime. My name is Asai Bediako. Let's begin with the Black Salaries of Ghana who will not be at next year's African Youth Championship despite beating the Young Lions of Senegal 1 0 at the Cape Coast Stadium on Friday in the second leg of the final qualifier. The Black Salaries needed to score two unanswered goals to secure qualification. Charles Barton scored the first goal of the game in the 33rd minute, but the national under-20 male football team could not get the much-needed second goal. This will be the first time the Black Allies have failed to make it to the African Youth Championship since winning the 2009 edition in Rwanda. And I'm Arba Kimson. Thanks for staying tuned and uh, have a lovely weekend. For more news, log on to myjoyonline.com. Good evening. This is Joy News Prime.